and I, I think we can move okay. Yeah, so um, I'm very excited about our speaker uh, this week. Um, it's Dr. Karen uh, Lenick, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at Georgia Tech, um, even though she lives up in Virginia. And uh, uh, Dr. Lenick is a geomorphologist whose research focuses on trying to understand uh, spatial patterns in uh, landscapes of Earth and Mars and maybe other uh, planetary bodies in the future, uh, mainly um, thinking about uh, big floods. And for her PhD, uh, mainly focused on the scablands of Eastern Washington. Uh, she uh, got her bachelor's degree in geological sciences um, from the College of William and Mary, and then a PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And um, after that, she started a postdoc here, working both with me and Dr. Uh, Carl Lang. And I will let uh, Dr. Lennox take it away. Thank you. Hey, yes. Thank you, Francis. Thank you to uh, everyone for being here. Um, yeah, it, it's great to be here talking with you all today. Um, as Francis mentioned, I'm a postdoc here in EAS, where I've been building off work I started during my PhD uh, to investigate this phenomenon that we call outburst flooding. And I'm doing that in a couple different landscapes around the world, as well as uh, on Mars. So outburst flooding is the catastrophic release of stored water. And the two key things in this very short definition are the storage, which allows for accumulation of really big volumes of water and a very short time span. So thinking about the discharge of a flood with uh, these two characteristics, um, or the discharge being the rate that the water is moving, you're dividing a really big number by a really small number. So that makes a really, really big number. And so this is why outburst flooding can be so powerful. So precipitation driven floods, which we call meteoric floods, can certainly be very large and problematic. Uh, so you, there's a picture here from some uh, meteoric floods in the Midwest a couple of years ago. We remember from hearing about it in the news. Um, so when precipitation exceeds infiltration, water levels can rise really fast in stream channels. And there's sort of a distribution of floods. Oh, you, good, you can see my mouse. A distribution of flood sizes you can get from precipitation, which is what's uh, shown on this diagram, where the biggest floods can transport the most sediment and do the most geomorphic work. But they occur the least frequently. And so um, the channels sort of adjust to an intermediate size flow. So outburst floods, on the other hand, don't fall onto this distribution of precipitation intensities because they can store the water equivalent of many precipitation events and their occurrence isn't necessarily tied to the short-term or seasonal patterns of weather. And the consequence of this for landscapes is that the erosional and depositional impacts of outburst floods can persist in landscapes for a very long time because outburst floods are so big that they can overtop drainage divides or incise to new base levels that other geomorphic processes just can't adjust to, uh, at least for a really long time. So there are a couple ways to get the storage and catastrophic release you need for an outburst flood. One way to store a lot of water is to dam an existing drainage network to create a reservoir of surface water. And often when we hear this, we think about dams constructed by people, which certainly are a big source of storage. And there's a lot of potential energy stored in reservoirs like these. Um, and in, in many places around the world, we rely on that energy to power our infrastructure. But there are also actually a lot of processes that dam rivers naturally to create a temporary uh, storage of surface water that happen without any, uh, any people doing anything. So these are things like landslides and glacier ice and the sediment they carry. Um, also things like lava flows or vegetation. And 
Both of those are examples of unstable temporary lakes, but there are also ways in which you can destabilize an otherwise stable lake by other geologic processes like earthquakes or debris flows. So on the, um, my, my left, I guess you're right, um, there's uh, an example from 2020 where there was a landslide in British Columbia that dumped a lot of sediment into a lake, which caused a tsunami in that lake that sort of splashed onto the opposite bank and started eroding that bank. Um, and that let even more water out, which could erode more sediment and started this sort of runaway erosion process happening. And the flood that resulted uh, swept away a lot of vegetation and disturbed really important salmon spawning habitats downstream. So even though maybe this wasn't the biggest flood that we know about, it still had a lot of really significant consequences. And we see evidence of similar processes happening on Mars during its warmer and wetter past as well. So water could drain into the topographic lows formed by craters, uh, but these were closed basins, so there would be no way to, for water to leave except by evaporation. So if you keep adding water, the lake levels are gonna rise until they can spill over the next lowest point on the rim. You can see here in Jezero Crater, where Perseverance is right now, there are two inlet channels where water could flow into the crater. And then on the other side, there's, uh, there's an outlet channel that was carved when the crater got too full and spillover uh, initiated an outburst flood. So this style of outburst flooding was happening on Mars probably between 4.1 and 3.7 billion years ago when liquid water could exist on the surface. And the prevalence of these crater channel features indicate that this was a really important process in shaping the surface of early Mars and establishing hydrologic connectivity. So accumulating surface water is one way to get that really high storage, but another way to store water is to freeze it. Uh, only it takes a really long time to melt big volumes of ice. So to get that short release time, you need some way to melt a lot of ice really fast, uh, maybe something like a volcano. And it gets colder as you get higher up in elevation, so it's not uncommon to find glaciers sitting on top of volcanoes in cold, volcanically active places like Iceland. So if this volcano here erupts, then uh, a big section of this glacier might be able to melt and get converted into flood water. And the name for this process is uh, comes from Icelandic, and it's written here, uh, you pronounce that Jökulup, hopefully something close to that. And Jökulups are not super common on Earth, at least in, on our modern planet, but we can find evidence that this process happened on Mars, because the size of some of the channels draining down um, for instance, Albemans, uh, this volcanic edifice on Mars, tell us that they can be really large floods that needed a big water source, uh, like a glacier, and that in turn tells us something about Mars's past climate. So this is the second phase of big floods that Mars experienced. Between about 3.7 and 3 billion years ago, Mars's interior cools down, and its magnetic field starts turning off, so it's losing its atmosphere, and liquid water is no longer stable on the surface. But there's still a lot of water around, frozen underground, and maybe sometimes on the surface, and that water ice can be melted by the remnant volcanic activity that was still happening. You can see these chaos terrains at the ends of a lot of canyons where the ground has collapsed. And those are probably the ice and water sources for floods in places here like Aries Vallis, there. So regardless of how you're storing and releasing this water, the large volumes and quick releases of outburst floods mean that there's a lot of energy available to do things like erode bedrock and transport sediment. So as far as we know, there aren't any special processes that only happen during outburst floods, but outburst floods can transport grain sizes larger than what the biggest meteoric floods can move, 
and they can surpass the minimum energy or threshold-based erosion processes like block plucking. And they can maintain that energy for longer as well. And for that reason, there are a few specific landforms that are fairly characteristic of landscapes which experienced outburst flooding. So these are things like dry waterfalls or plunge pools that were carved by water moving with a lot of energy. Uh, also things like canyons with very straight walls because the water is sustaining this high energy level um, and the water can cover the whole valley floor. And you might also get polished surfaces in places that don't usually get wet, but have been uh, smoothed out by floods. And eventually the water loses energy and has to start dropping sediment. So you can get some characteristic deposits from outburst floods as well. Um, so these can be things like streamlined islands, these big piles of fine sediment that are oriented in the direction of flow. Um, or giant current ripples, the ones in those pictures are, uh, there's a couple meters from each crust to the next. Uh, so you need really fast moving water to create bed forms that big. Um, you can also get really large pieces of rock carried along with the flow, either sort of bouncing along the bed or frozen in icebergs. Um, and I'm sitting on one, one of those right there. And you can also get uh, really thick layered deposits of fine grained sediments that build up in sheltered areas of the flow called slack water deposits. And we see a lot of these landforms in outflow channels on Mars. Um, and here in Aries Vallis, we see dry waterfalls and streamlined islands, reorganized drainage networks. And this is how, uh, why we think that floods, um, specifically outburst floods, played a big role in shaping this landscape. So when we're trying to understand the hydrology of floods in the past, these preserved erosional or depositional features that persist in landscape are the main clues that we have. And in places like Mars, they can be the only clues we have. And different features give us insight into different properties of the flood, uh, but only if we know something about the relationship between flood hydrology and the landforms they create. So we wanna be able to say, for instance, that a flood with this discharge would create a canyon with this width, but there are a lot of other variables that go into this relationship besides the flood hydrology. And these can be things like the bedrock fracture geometry, uh, the sediment grain size distribution, uh, maybe the topographic relief. And it would be really great to isolate some of these variables <clears throat> and experiment systematically to uh, figure this out, but this is really hard to do with outburst floods uh, because for one, instruments are not usually designed to withstand high energy flows. And also outburst floods are really unpredictable. So we don't know when or where they're gonna happen and we can't plan monitoring around that. That's part of the reason why they can be so damaging. So instead we model the floods on the computer and this lets us play around with things like the starting water volume and the topography in a way that we just, we can't do in nature. So as I just explained it as like building a world in Minecraft because what we're doing is we're discretizing the landscape and then we can modify it to reflect the initial conditions of the system. So thinking about things like topography and the distribution of different materials uh, the physical properties of those materials. And then we let the system evolve according to rules of physics and fluid dynamics. And what we're looking for is uh, to see whether uh, our model predictions of things like inundation area uh, or the, uh, the flood energy or the distribution of um, erosional and depositional landforms, whether these things match uh, field observations of these things. And this is really powerful because it's not a one-way relationship between floods and landscapes. The topography plays a big role in what parts of the landscape get inundated and where maybe you're gonna have the highest uh, energy, but the flood water is also modifying the landscape through erosion and deposition. So we expect there to be some relationship here, right? A bigger flood should probably erode a bigger canyon, 
Uh, but if we can start to get at some of the processes by which these are connected, we can use the landscape features left behind by outburst floods to answer more specific questions like how many floods they carved and how big they were. And it's great to learn about the outburst floods themselves, but this also gives us insight into the conditions necessary for that storage and release to happen. And it invites us to consider some of the potential secondary in, uh, effects of outburst flooding. So to start to get at this relationship between topography and flood hydrology, uh, we're gonna go to a place in Eastern Washington called the Channeled Scabland, which is where I uh, spent most of my PhD studying. Uh, so here the evidence of past outburst floods is really well preserved and it's really easy to see even in the modern satellite imagery. So during the last ice age, most of this region was covered in a fine glacial sediment called luss. And you can see that in the tan areas and, and now uh, it's really good farming soils. So you can see the sort of grid pattern of agriculture there. Um, but the dark areas are places where that luss has been eroded uh, to expose the underlying basalt bedrock. You can also see a few really big flood carved canyons, which locally are called coolies. And zooming out for a moment to see uh, the, the setup during the last ice age, we have glaciers blocking rivers in the, uh, the Northwest to create several glacial lakes the largest of which was this one here, Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, and over the course of the last ice age, the glacial dam, which was holding it back, would break up when the lake got too big or if the ice got too weak. And it probably happened over a hundred times with each breakup releasing large volumes of water in the form of outburst floods across the uh, relatively unincised Columbia Plateau. And here in the Channeled Scabland, we have two really prominent canyon complexes, Grand Coulee and Moses Coulee. So these canyons were incised into columnar jointed bedrock of the Columbia River Basalt Group, which is that, again, that dark brown bedrock. And estimates of paleo flow depth are often constrained by erosional or depositional features formed by shallow flows at more or less the maximum limits of inundation. And we call these things high water marks. So in the channeled scabland, these are, are things like those ice rafted boulders or reworked luss uh, or scoured bedrock. And these are probably fairly reliable indicators of paleo flow extent in places where there was minimal change in the elevation of the channel floor. But in channels with significant erosion or deposition, trying to force hydraulic models to match high water marks could be causing us to over or underestimate the flood size respectively. So an alternative to emplacing the high water marks by filling the canyon with water is to have them emplaced by the earliest flows from before the canyon was carved. So to carve a canyon in fractured bedrock like what we have in the Scabland, erosion initiates at slope breaks which erode themselves backwards since the position of the slope break is sort of moving upstream as the material on the face of the waterfall is getting removed. So if you were standing maybe over here, uh, here at a point um, upstream of the waterfall, you would see broad and shallow flows washing past you. Uh, but then once the waterfall moves further upstream, all the water can now fit into the canyon that's just been incised. And we hypothesize that this is how those big canyons in the Scabland formed, because we've documented this waterfall retreat process happening in modern analogs, in similar highly fractured bedrock. Uh, we've replicated it in uh, physical models and um, the, the, these, uh, working out the mechanics of this tells us that it's an incredibly efficient process at high energy flows. So 
The first thing we wanted to know was how different the flood sizes we expect from these two different scenarios would be for those two biggest canyons in the channel Scadland. This is something we can test out pretty easily using geospatial analysis and hydraulic modeling. So the first step is to reconstruct the pre-flood valley floor, essentially uh, filling the canyon back up with rock. Uh, and to do that, we have to decide how we're going to reconstruct a missing surface. So if it were a narrower valley, we might just interpolate a flat plane between the two banks or maybe a, a V-shaped valley. Uh, but these canyons are hundreds of meters wide. So we wanted to try a bit of a more complicated method of topographic reconstruction, which was to project the stream profiles of hanging tributaries like those uh, which are left over from the pre-flood drainage network. Uh, we project them back into the middle of the canyon to rebuild the Paleo Valley floors in these two uh, flood-carved canyons. So the idea behind using the pre-flood drainage network is that streams tend to develop concave up profiles that can be described by a logarithmic equation. So this means we can extrapolate a missing portion of the stream's profile by fitting the steepness index and concavity index to the intact portion. So if this is the stream profile before the floods, and then along comes a flood and erodes the bedrock really rapidly, but only in the path where it's going, uh, the tributaries that used to drain into the canyon don't have enough energy to keep up with all that erosion so they persist in the landscape as hanging tributaries. So we extract the elevations along the portion of the tributary upstream of where it intersects the canyon rim. We find the steepness and concavity indices that best fit that portion of the profile. And then we project that relationship back uh, downstream into the center of the canyon to get a pre-flood channel floor elevations. It's represented by that uh, that red dot right there. So if we do this for a lot of tributaries down the full length of the canyon, we get a lot of red dots and we can use them to build a pre-flood profile for each flood channel. So next we interpolate between the pre-flood channel profile and the two rims of the canyon to fill in the topography for the rest of the canyon. And the total elevation difference between the modern and the reconstructed topography also gives an, us a, a nice estimate of the eroded volume in each. Uh, and that comes out to about 68 cubic uh, kilometers for Upper Grand Coulee and 14.5 cubic kilometers in Moses Coulee. So now that we have our two topography end members, we're looking for the smallest discharge that inundates high water marks for uh, the two canyons on both the reconstructed and the modern topography. So we let water in at the upstream end, uh, and then it's allowed to flow throughout the domain and exit uh, on the downstream end. And what we're doing is testing a range of constant discharges and letting each one reach steady state. Uh, and then we check to see whether it's inundated the high water marks, these green circles. Uh, and if it doesn't, we try a slightly higher discharge to sort of iteratively find the one that just barely inundates high water marks. Um, and I should clarify that we are running the models to steady state, not because we think that the floods necessarily were at steady state, but that allows us to compare different flood sizes using the maximum amount of inundation for a given discharge. Uh, so here are the inundated extents for each canyon, and we see that sure enough, it takes a lot less water to inundate the same high water mark uh, after reconstructing the pre-flood topography uh, than it does when we use just the modern topography. And for both of the canyons, it takes just 20 to 40 percent of the discharge needed on the modern topography to inundate the same spots uh, on the reconstructed pre-flood topography. So we see that the topography that the floods would have encountered is something that we should consider because we can we predict much smaller flood sizes if 
you're inundating the pre-flood landscape compared to the post-flood one. So now we can start testing the smaller flood size against other field evidence to see whether a smaller number of floods is consistent with the erosional and depositional features in the landscape. Uh, we'll start with a quantity we can compare against depositional evidence, uh, namely the number of canyon carving floods. So to get the number of canyon carving floods, our approach is going to be to use sediment transport rates to estimate how long it would take to remove the missing volume of bedrock once it becomes sediment. Uh, since we have the difference in volume between the pre-flood and the post-flood topography from the reconstruction process. Uh, so one nice thing about this approach is that we don't have to assume any particular erosion process. Uh, all you need is a grain size, and we can easily test a range of those constrained by field measurements, and we need a shear stress, which we can get from our hydraulic models. So the discharge we want is the one that inundates high water marks on the reconstructed topography, but the topography that we want is actually going to be the modern topography because that's what's going to be just downstream of where the erosion is happening. Uh, so we, we run a third set of models representing those conditions, and we average the shear stresses near the downstream ends of our canyons, which come out to be around one to 2,000 pascals. Uh, and Moses Cooley is on here twice because we had two high water marks in Moses Cooley that we were looking at. Um, and so each one has a distinct discharge uh, and shear stress associated with it. Uh, but both of them are pretty close. Okay, so I'll summarize the calculations that we do to get the minimum number of floods, uh, starting by estimating the bed load flux using the shear stresses from our models and a grain size estimated from boulders on top of a depositional bar at Moses Cooley. Then we calculate the amount of suspended sediment, which we estimate using a ratio of suspended to bed load sediment from the approximate volumes of offshore fine grain deposits and coarse grain terrestrial flood deposits. That works out to be about 8.3. Next, we calculate the total sediment volume flux through the canyon as the sum of the bed load and the suspended flux multiplied by the average width of the canyon reach where we got our shear stresses. We divide the missing volume of bedrock by that flux to get the total time it would take to move it all. And then finally, divide that by the duration of the high energy portion of a single flood, estimated to be about 100 hours from models of the entire flood system uh, to finally get the number of floods. So clearly there are a lot of assumptions that go into this estimate, but our goal with this was really to see whether we could use sediment transport mechanics to get a number of floods close to what's recorded in the sedimentary record. Okay, so let's find out if that is the case. Based on sediment transport rates, we estimated that it would take four to eight floods to remove all the bedrock <laughs> in Moses Cooley and five to seven floods for upper Grand Coulee. And correlating offshore and terrestrial flood deposits along the entire flood route has revealed that there were about 100 to 110 floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. But this includes floods that took other routes through the channeled scabland that bypassed these two canyons, uh, as well as deposits that are sitting on the floor of Moses Coulee and upper Grand Coulee so those would have to post-date the erosion of the canyon there. Um, An upper Grand Coulee in particular has a lot of these smaller later flood deposits, uh, but the record in Moses Coulee is much more tightly constrained and points to at least four floods down that route and probably not too many more um, since they were later floods. Um, and we also find that our estimates are rather nicely bracketed by other estimates of specifically the number of high energy floods, and that's based on the elevation of high water marks in uh, portions of the flood route where there was not a lot of erosion. Um, and so the number of floods that we estimate is less than 10% of the estimated total number of floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. So if this is right, it means it's possible that only a handful of the floods actually contributed to eroding the canyons. So if we assume that each of these floods 
contributed equally to incising the canyon, we can ballpark some erosion and waterfall retreat rates, which are on the order of hundreds uh, to thousands of cubic meters per second for erosion rates and hundreds to thousands of meters per day for retreat rates. So this is quite a bit faster than any example we have on Earth. Um, Excuse me. Can you explain what retreat rate means? Yeah, so the waterfall is kind of stepping back. It's eroding itself backwards, and the retreat rate is the speed at which that's happening. OK, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so this the, the retreat rates are a lot faster than uh, anything we've observed on Earth, anything we've sort of estimated on Earth. Um, for instance, there was a, a dam break flood in Texas that was eroding through fractured limestone. Um, and that incised back seven meters over three days. Um, that's this one here. So that comes out to a retreat rate, rate of 0 0.0023 kilometers per day compared to these multiple kilometer per day retreat rates. Um, but, you know, it's worth keeping in mind that the Missoula floods were a lot larger than these, any of these other floods. So it's possible that maybe erosion becomes increasingly efficient at higher discharges for extreme floods over similar types of bedrock. So the number of floods predicted by sediment transport rates also closely matches field-based evidence for uh, high energy floods. And what's really neat about this is that for flood carved canyons, this could be a way to estimate the number of erosion generating floods just from quantities that can be constrained remotely which is really great for canyons in less accessible places like Antarctica or Mars. But we also need to consider the erosional side and see whether smaller floods can still generate enough power to erode the bedrock and uh, incise a canyon, produce that sediment in the first place. So to test this, we're gonna fill in just the upstream half of Upper Grand Coulee to represent incomplete erosion of the waterfall. So that, that waterfall would have started right here around where there's sort of a, a fold, um, and then it would have eroded itself backwards, um, eventually eroding all the way to the Columbia River. Um, so we're gonna reconstruct the topography in this way and compare the modeled shear stresses along the edge of the reconstructed waterfall where the columns can be plucked to thresholds for toppling estimated from properties of the bedrock. So Grand Coulee and Moses Coulee were both incised in columnar basalt, which is uh, this, this rock with regularly spaced vertical fractures that you see here. Um, those form naturally during the lava cooling process. And other studies using physical and numerical models have demonstrated that a waterfall eroding through vertically fractured bedrock can only maintain a vertical face if the height of the toppling block is the same as the height of the waterfall. So in Grand Coulee, this means that the toppling blocks would include multiple lava flows with through going vertical fractures um, separating adjacent blocks. So in this diagram, it'd be uh, rotating around P1, but if instead you were to rotate around P2 or P3, uh, the models predict that the height of the, uh, the head wall decreases over time and you'd get like a stair step pattern. Um, and uh, what's really nice about the columnar basalt is that it's a very regular fracture spacing. And so you can estimate the shear stress it would take to topple a stack of columns just from the fracture geometry. So to get that fracture geometry, we went out to a place called Steamboat Rock, which is uh, this little butte of uh, pre-flood topography in Upper Grand Coulee, where the waterfall, as it was eroding, it sort of split and then reconnected again upstream. Um, and so we measured the uh, fracture spacing of a bunch of intact columns. And we set up a factor of safety equation to compare the driving forces acting to uh, rotate the block around the pivot point P 
uh, sorry, driving torques, um, and we compared them with the resisting torques trying to keep it in place. So the block is stable if the resisting torques on the top of this equation are, um, are greater than the driving torques on the bottom, and the column should topple if the factor of safety Fs goes below one. And we're trying to solve for this parameter here, which is the bed shear stress required to destabilize a block. And after solving for all the torques and simplifying things, you end up with a really disgusting looking equation, but everything other than the bed shear stress is either a physical constant or something we can estimate from our field measurements. So we plug in our distribution of block fracture geometries we get shear stress thresholds ranging from several hundred to over a thousand pascals. So next we go back to our models and pull out the predicted shear stresses along the edge of the reconstructed waterfall. We overlay the toppling thresholds that we just calculated, and we see that they actually overlap quite nicely, exceeding the erosion thresholds for different populations of blocks that we measured at Seamboat Rock <clears throat> but really not going overly above that. So with these smaller discharge floods, not only is the number of floods predicted by sediment transport rates close to field-based estimates for high energy floods, these discharges produce shear stresses that just exceed erosion thresholds uh, for processes that the geomorphology indicates were dominant in forming this landscape. Uh, and other studies have taken this even further to say that the shear stresses produced by discharges, which fill up the modern canyon all the way to the brim, uh, would generate much higher shear stresses than the erosion thresholds for bedrock in this area, meaning that the canyons should have been much bigger, but then those canyons wouldn't have been filled all the way to their brims, right? So assuming we're capturing uh, the erosional and depositional processes reasonably well. It's pretty impossible to see um, how brimful flow through fully incised canyons could be compatible with the field evidence that we observe and the physical limits of erosion and depositional processes. So if it takes lower discharges to carve features like we see in the scab land, what other implications does that have for our understanding of this planet? Well, one thing is that we often use long-term erosion rates as a window into other processes like uplift or climate change, because over long time scales, stream erosion responds to changes at slope or hydrology. But if one outburst flood can produce like a thousand years of erosion in weeks, we might be overestimating the rates of some of those other processes in places that have experienced outburst floods. And considering multiple floods, for floodwaters to reach the same spot in a canyon that's getting bigger, that would mean that floods also have to be getting bigger with the implication that the storage is gonna have to increase also for this to happen. So you'd need the ice dam to be getting stronger or bigger over time, which would be strange in the case of the Scabland, considering the flooding was happening uh, at the end of the last glacial maximum when most glaciers would be retreating. But if instead only the first few floods have to be really big for the canyon to get carved, and those big floods can be about the same size as each other, it's a lot easier to reconcile with what's going on at the ice dam. And because dumping such large volumes of fresh water into the ocean at one place all at once can influence global ocean circulation patterns, which in turn has a strong influence on climate. Knowing how much water was conveyed by these really large outburst floods is a really important constraint for climate and ocean circulation models. So I'm happy to say that on Earth, it's becoming less and less common to use the modern topography to estimate things like flood size and lands, uh, in landscapes eroded predominantly by outburst floods, uh, because we have so many more sources of data like core stratigraphy and geochemical dating techniques at our disposal and topographic reconstruction methods are now way fancier than my hanging tributary 
method. Um, but data is much more limited on Mars and topography is often one of the only sources of data available to us. So it's still really common to estimate flood hydrology by modeling a hydrograph in which the peak discharge corresponds to brimful flow in fully incised canyons. And if the bedrock geology on Mars is similar to that in the Scablian, which is pretty likely given the similarity of landforms we see in these two places, this means that assuming brimful flow would overestimate Martian discharges potentially by quite a lot. So what are some of the implications of smaller Martian outburst floods? Well, thinking first about the earlier phase of outburst flooding from crater lake overflows, this might solve an issue where assumptions of brimful flows predict flood volumes that exceed the volumes of the basins that they drain. And there are other ways where you could explain this discrepancy. For instance, multiple floods or conversion of the flood channel into a river channel. But if that were the case, you'd expect to see evidence of either of those in the landscape and see things like terraces or V-shaped valleys. And we don't always see that. And thinking now about the later phase of larger outburst flooding, uh, reducing flood sizes has some even more interesting implications. Uh, so to reduce the amount of water necessary for brimful flows, the subsurface would have to be really permeable in those chaos regions that were the source of water from ground ice. So something on the order of loose gravel to have enough space for all that water in the, uh, the pore spaces. But if we scale the flood discharges down by a factor of three, which was the difference between the flood sizes using the modern and the reconstructed topography uh, in the scablands, you could have lower aquifer permeability that's more similar to fractured bedrock, uh, which again is more consistent with many of the landforms we see on Mars, like buttes and canyons that might collapse if they were made of looser material. Lower discharges would also require less total heat input because you wouldn't have to melt quite a lar as large of a volume of ice. And that means that conditions might have been suitable for outburst flooding later on a slightly less uh, volcanically active planet as opposed to only being possible when there was a lot of geothermal activity. And finally, even though we're talking about relatively smaller floods, these smaller floods would still be huge, you know, well over 100 million cubic meters per second. All of the water on Mars at that time would probably be equivalent to at least 200 floods. So you'd have the water necessary for multiple or episodic outburst flooding. And in these large outflow channels, we do often see evidence of multiple flood surfaces. Uh, I think in Aries Vallis, it's at least six surfaces with distinct ages based on crater counting. So in terms of sustaining a Northern Ocean, if it was receiving multiple smaller floods over a longer time span, as opposed to just a handful of really big floods, that might have allowed for a more persistent ocean that could have provided potential habitat for longer. So we still have a lot to learn about outburst floods and the landscapes they create. But it's a really exciting time to be working on outburst floods because people are starting to recognize how important this process has been in shaping landscapes on both Earth and Mars uh, and finding examples of outburst floods all over space and time. And since this is the Explorigens group, I wanted to end by saying that uh, besides their geomorphic impacts, outburst floods have played a huge role in shaping human societies on Earth. You know, you can find examples of outburst floods shaping culture around the world from Chinese art to Norse sagas and indigenous legends, traditional architecture in India. And it makes me wonder that if there was still any life hanging out in there on Mars as liquid water was having its last gasp, would outburst floods have been a destructive or a supportive force? So I will leave it there and thank my advisors and mentors and colleagues who have supported this work. Thank you all for sticking with me and I'm excited to chat about this more.